So it's now 2025, and I feel very confident in saying that software engineering, as we know it today, is completely over. Now, what happens next, that's the kind of the interesting part. In recent news, everyone's talking about how ChatGPT's O3 has come out, and it's just like shattering AI benchmarks about how it's processing software engineering type work. So that's going to influence a lot what's going to happen in this in the year 2025. So what happens next in software engineering is basically going to circle around uh, one word. And that word to me is restraint. So it's safe to say that things have completely changed now that uh, people are using AI to help code, to help learn, to basically advance the craft of software engineering. But since like the dawn of software engineering, like 50, 60 years ago, we've always kind of had the same problem. And that same problem is that software projects, they were always very expensive and they always took a long time to finish. Like even the more complicated projects, it would just take a long time to get everything done. And more often than not is the finished product isn't everything that the client or the user kind of asked for. It's just kind of, it, it, it sometimes and often falls short of what requirements were given in the first place. And honestly, some projects never even finished in the first place. But in 2025, like that paradigm has actually changed quite a bit. I know a lot of people talk about AI replacing software engineers, but I think we can stop talking about that. And it's more about the question of like, you know, uh, engineer using AI to basically become super productive and super powerful as like an individual contributor. That's more of the conversation we should be having. I mean, it's allowed us to basically take on more work to get stuff done more more quickly, We're able to jump into new projects and new frameworks uh, very easily and be able to learn right off the bat by using AI to help us like translate our, our current knowledge and jump into new projects, no matter what the language is, without like any sort of ramp up at all. If you know how to code, then you can easily use AI to help you code in the next thing. So that gives you even more productive power to jump from project to project. So in summary, that means that we are able to build like complicated system so much faster now, so much faster. But honestly, like the question then becomes, uh, well, what does that mean? What does that mean for like kind of the industry? First off, I wanna let everyone know is that the thirst for new projects and businesses to like make more money, that will never go away. It will always increase. If there's a, if there's a way to make more, then businesses and companies will still want that. They're not just going to just, just give up and say like, well, I've had enough software today. That's okay. So I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that is the industry dead? Like, should I just like give up and go build a cabin in the woods? And, and no, there's still going to be need for software developers and software engineers, but the, uh, the expected output is just going to be so much larger than it has been for the past like 50 or 60 years. So let's go ahead and talk about restraint is what I want to talk about in this video. First off, I kind of want to give a story about uh, the, some of my background and also like why I think I'm kind of laying the premise of, uh, of my argument of how we're going to need restraint in the very near future is uh, in the past, I've gotten to work with uh, one of the top consulting firms that has built software over the past like 20 years. And I say this with complete confidence, like the company and the engineers at this uh, consultancy were so good and I was able to learn so much of them, so much from them. They were so good, they were able to charge a premium. Their minimum contracts were at least uh, charging for $20,000 a week for only two programmers. And usually the projects would be in the millions range just before you could even have, have a conversation to start with. And these are some of the smartest people in the industry to be able to produce software at such a fast rate. That's why they're able to charge such a high rate. So their process included like planning everything down to the finest detail and, a, and being able to shovel the work to engineers and developers to be able to, and, and designers and product managers be able to crunch through the work in a very efficient process and always march towards the direct and very clear goal. And they did that in a very fast fashion. And more often than not, when they were working on these projects, you could basically ask for any feature that you wanted for wanted, and they'd be able to uh, to not slow down. They would be able to add more and more features, and it just was a matter of how much money you were willing to spend, really. So then let's let's pause for a second. Now, anyone who has been building software for about ten years or so, they will immediately realize that uh, this is kind of the bad part of things is because like when you make decisions like that all the time and you're building like crazy, 
you are creating kind of a maintenance nightmare for you and your company for the next 10 to 15 years. If you're the only person in the world that is focused, that has this library, that you're using this software or this uh, repository, then you're in charge of maintaining it. Like software, even the most bulletproof software will still need security updates, will still need to have new features added onto it to make things work a little bit better over the years and also understanding how it works. So if you had a $5 million project that you just built up that you still have to keep in mind is that there's gonna be a maintenance team almost that will have to take care of that software for the next like 10 to 15 years. So as a business, if you had the budget and this, this sounds great, this sounds wonderful. Like how could this ever be a bad thing? But I'm here to say that there is a kind of a darker side to the, uh, to that kind of work is the fact that when you are able to build as many features as you want, as met, as much functionality as you want in your software systems, uh, there is kind of a dark side to it. And that is just on the long tail of maintenance on the other side. This is where I, there's a little bit of crit criticism here is that uh, when you are asked to do so many features and you're able to just crank them out as much as possible, it becomes, you become more of like a feature factory. It's not considering much of like the goals of the company. It's just being, uh, just doing what you're asked for and just building feature after feature after feature. And the problem is, is that especially when you are dealing with people with deep pockets and you're trying to build something very specific, you start asking the questions of being like, well, there's a library for this, but you know what? I don't want to do that. I'm going to build it in house. That's something that's said a lot when you have the ability to do so. I'm going to build this library in house, or if this vendor has everything, but like one little requirement for what I need it to do for, you know what? I'm going to build it myself and we'll maintain it here. And there's also situations where, you could look at an open source uh, code base and you're like, you know what? This is pretty cool. They're not moving fast enough. So you know what? I'm going to create a fork of their code base and you know what? We'll maintain it ourselves. And it just basically turns into like, I just want to build, 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 build. And you're just building forever as fast as you can for as long as you can. So let's come back to today. So why is that relevant to the conversations around AI and how we're building software in 2025? Well, it's now the great realization is that like, Almost any uh, competent, like senior software engineer could be doing this level of work for nearly any company is that now we have the capability to move incredibly fast and build nearly anything that you would like as soon as you would like, almost regardless of your skill sets. Even if you like have an inkling of like how to build a project with AI, with like, you know, all these AI tools, you, you have the ability to like build this product. So this is where the conversation around the word restraint comes into play and restraint is going to be very very important for the next like 10 years as we're building software because just because uh someone on the business side just because someone in the engineering team says that we need to build this project and you know that you can it doesn't mean that you should it's definitely a very cautious like you need to be pragmatic about like why and how you're building these projects these libraries these systems these services be careful because there's always the cost, the taxation of maintenance afterwards. So if you become a senior software engineer and then you become a feature factory that you are just cranking out every single thing that anyone ever asks of you, you are, you are building a maintenance nightmare for you and anyone else that stays at the company for the next five to 10 years. If that project sticks around in a company ecosystem and becomes business dependent, then that's gonna stay there for a very long time. And not only will you have to just add to it, but you have to maintain it for a long time. So there's now this, we're, software engineering is no longer the focus of how to build at the beginning. It's now a conversation of like how to do that, but then also like how do we maintain and also like govern this gi giant ball of software that's gonna be built in a very quick succession over the next couple of years. So it may sound a little bit dr dramatic of me saying like software engineering is over. And in a way, I still think that statement stands because it's no longer like about just kind of building the software. You have to be able to do that, but then you also have to have the ability to have restraint of like, what am I gonna be building? And if it's gonna be something that is worth my time, you, just because you can build a project in a weekend and you think that it's going to be good for the business, doesn't mean you have to, doesn't mean you need to, because no matter what it is, software is never, oh, I'm done, software is done, I never have to touch it again. It is always 
the follow-up maintenance hellscape afterwards that every company, every business, every software engineer will have to deal with in the future. Now, I'm saying that you can build the projects that are very critical in helping the business. Of course, that'd be great to be able to crunch uh, to crank those out. But we got to be careful about like uh, just building stuff ourselves because we can. Because you always have to consider and think like kind of like a product manager of saying like whether or not I am willing and should be willing to maintain this for a long time. Uh, so it kind of boils down to two big new things, and it's like the ability to say no to a project. The first skill is being able to say no uh, about something that may not be necessary. And the second skill is also using AI in your own software uh, experience to maintain legacy code, because there's going to be a lot of lot more legacy code that is running these businesses. And if it's spun up quickly with AI, you're going to have to be able to also maintain it, but also understand like how and why it was built in the first place in order to like keep these businesses running in the near future. We can't just like keep on building, throwing it away, building, throwing it away, because that is not how like businesses or this career actually like makes any sense. There has to be a level of maintaining afterwards. And that's the, that's going to be the sticking point. It's going to be very difficult for everyone. Now, I know that sounds like a little bit of doom and gloom, but I have some more videos coming out that I'm going to talk about uh, whether or not it's still a good idea to get a computer science degree in 2025. I'm going to talk about you know, freelancing and stuff in 2025. So if, if stick around if you want to hear more videos about that. But also, I think you also like this video on top of that. But also, like, if you've made it this far in the video, please put like a robot in the comments. And I want to thank you personally for uh, for watching this long. But either way, thank you guys for listening. And I will see you guys in the next one. See ya.